Allie, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is the best day of my life. I love it. I love it. It it is the best day of your life. It is. <laughs> and it I is. did not coerce you into saying that, right? Not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. <laughs> well, listen, before we before we get um, before we get into your background and your story, I think it's very interesting for the audience to know that we met recently. Um, you were with your 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 husband and I was with my wife and we were in Mexico and we were. We, were, we were having a pretty awesome time. And, you know, that's why I encourage people to go on vacation because you never know who you're going to meet. Honestly, it's so true. <laughs> there yeah. could have been so many times that I rescheduled this, but it, it, the story is too perfect. It's too perfect. We had a great conversation while maybe having a couple of cocktails, possibly. <laughs> and your story really resonated with me and is all is what this show is all about. And I want you I invited you to be on the show and you so graciously accepted. Absolutely. I yeah. also feel so but... <laughs> you have left you you you've been, you've left w you you left w2 and then you went back so that's really what we yes. want to focus on today but you know let's uh give the listeners some background on you i mean take as far as far back as you want to go and then we'll, sure. we'll kind of dive into your your first escape from w2 absolutely so i went to school in la for english literature um absolutely 180 degree difference from where i am today um so I graduated back when the economy was crashing again, you know, the first yeah. time in my life. Um, and I had no idea what to do. No one was hiring English teachers. So I moved to South America and I became fluent in Spanish. And that was the first kind of taste that I had of entrepreneurship because I started an English Institute. I was supposed to be there for four months, ended up staying for a year and a half. Um, and my mom forced me to come home because I had some student loans <laughs> that I had to kind of take over. So that's kind of where I got my first real taste of of owning my own business. And yeah. when I came home, um, because I was fluent in another language, a very well reputable tech company, Salesforce, um, needed you know Spanish speakers, and so that's how I got my start in tech, and it really just took off from there. Um, my next company, I worked at Twitter. Uh, that's where I met my husband. And it's been, you know, a couple companies since. Um, so I really climbed the ladder really, really quickly. In that time period, I want to say, you know, seven years into my tech career, um, I got really tired <laughs> and really burned out. And this was before the pandemic. So, you know, yeah. I can't imagine having worked through that. But um I took some time, I created my own company and I left tech for about a year, year and a couple months. And I started a CPG brand, which is so different from what I'm doing today. Um, but we can get into the details of kind of my pitfalls and what I learned in that experience. But um, I ended up back in tech. Um, I live in California, so it, it you know it wasn't gonna be sustainable without a really thoughtful plan and I needed to kind of go back to the drawing boards. Ah, okay. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. A lot to, un a lot to unpack there. I don't know if you told me and if you did, I apologize that you majored, <laughs> in, it majored in English literature. Yeah. And so you got into t tech like kind of in an unconventional way. Honestly, yes, I was, I had already signed a onboarding contract for Tishman Speyer for a commercial real estate company. Um, I was on a completely different path and I got this last minute interview at Salesforce. I wasn't even going to go. And my mom forced me to, my best friend forced me to, and you know, the rest is history. Okay. So what, what was it that forced you? Because I think you said a couple of things in your first go at tech that you were it was you were kind of tired. I think I think those yes. are the words that you used. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe expand on that a little bit more, and then talk to me about talk to us about the CPG brand. Like, what is that? Yeah. And then talk about the company you started. Absolutely. So, I left. Um, you know, burnout is such a buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. um, and I was feeling the effects of that even before, you know, mental health health was really brought into the workforce, especially in, in tech. Um, you know, everyone talks about it now, but no one was talking about it then. 
I had just, uh, I had just lost my mom. And so it was just, you know, juggling that juggling. Yeah. I had a really bad digestive issue juggling. I'm in sales. So juggling a massive quota, um, it was, it just became too much. And I always say this, that losing my mom, while probably the most devastating thing I've ever had to go through was the, the clearest and most at peace I had ever been because at that moment, I just didn't care. There was just so everything fell into perspective and I came to realize really, it doesn't, at the end of the day, this doesn't matter. You know, your the money you make and the value you associate to it doesn't matter. Um, cause at the end of the day, it's all about the people you love and the, the, the memories you're making and, you know, it's all of that good stuff. And so that's when I decided to start my own company. I named it after her. It was called simply is her name's Isabel. Uh, her birthday was actually yesterday. She would be 62. Um, and as I had mentioned before, I was dealing with a lot of digestive issues, probably because of stress, probably because of, you know, eight years of grinding, you know, that's the whole, the whole concept of sales is smile and dial, grind, work hard, play hard, and it just became too much because yeah. I, I mean, I've heard you say this on other podcasts at what expense does this money mean? And for, in my, in my case, it was my health. Um, and so I had, I was diagnosed with something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, mm -hmm. which is very similar to IBS. Um, but they give you that, you know, you're diagnosed and they slide this list of, of foods that you're not allowed to eat across the table. And you look at it like, what the heck? Like, I can't have an apple. I can have blueberries, but only 40. <laughs> I'm not going to carry around a scale, yeah. sir. <laughs> um, and so I decided to to start a snack company so that, you know, people wouldn't have to think about, you know, how many almonds does this have? How many cashews does this have? Oh my goodness. Does it have a little bit of apple? I don't know. I'm going to be bloated and look pregnant for the next two days if I eat something like that. Yeah. So, um, so I started that and uh, this tagline was, we give a shit so you don't have to. <laughs> uh, that's so uh, you're awesome, by the way. I'm so <laughs> glad you're on the show. You're, 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 this is why we invited you. And you said so many things that really resonated with me. I just want to ask you, I love that you named it after your mom. And then you had this moment of clarity um, about perspective. And, and that's super important. I think a lot of us think that, but you had the wherewithal to actually follow through with it. Yeah. Um, grinding for eight years. What does that, what does that mean? Like how many hours are you working? Like, is it just pouring over into all, into your entire life? I mean, tell us more about that. Yes. When you're in sales, you feel like you're a doctor, except no one is dying. And that's, that's what people just don't realize. I feel in the tech world is mm -hmm. everything is just do or die. And, and it becomes like takes over your personality. It takes over your, your entire life. It takes over your schedule. It takes over your mind, body, and spirit. And what we don't realize is no one's going to die. If I don't sell this software, no one's going to die. If you know, this customer is upset for another couple hours, or if, you know, it, it, it it's gotten so intense, especially during a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, where you are now feeling like, if you're not working 12 hours, you're not doing it correctly. If you're not answering your phone at 4 a.m. or you know your anniversary weekend, or you know you're missing sporting events or or family barbecues, it's almost become a noble thing to be working as much as you can. Yeah. And so wow. it just became. I, I remember it was right before my mom died. I'm going to drop a bomb. I'm sure you remember this, but I had a stroke and I remember going to the hospital. I was in the back of an ambulance having a stroke. My brain was bleeding. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk, couldn't use my right side. And I was calling my manager to tell her everything that needed to be said in my sales calls the next day, you know, this, the steps that we needed to close these A, B and C deals. And that was my first thought. My first thought was not call my mom, call my dad, say bye to my family if I die. It was, oh yeah, 
this deal needs to go come in. And so shortly after that, my mom died. And that's when I, it just all fell into place. And I was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we, yeah, that's, um, I, I, I remember that. I can't, I, I just, it, it, it's crazy that you get to that point. I was like that too. I used to, you know, close deals on vacation and yeah, and I get it. And, and part of it is like the expectation you set on yourself and then yes. what the company uh, sets the expectation as well. And again, this is what, this is like the price that you pay when you're highly compensated, you know, tech industry pays a lot of money and Absolutely. it's like, that's, what's expected of you. I think. Exactly. And, and then yeah. being a female on top of it, well, you know, I was at a conference last week and in a room full of 300 males, there were 10, I counted 10 females. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're, you're held to a higher standard. You know, you know, I listen to some of the males on my team, their calls, and I'm like, what? That's the standard. And I'm operating here, but it's almost like you can't slip up because there's so, there's such a stigma against females in, in tech. Yeah. So it's I, extra I, pressure. <laughs> I, yeah, and not that you need any more. So no. <laughs> All right. So talk about the the you start this company. You know, dedicated to your mother. You're passionate about it. Like you have this clarity. You're excited about it. To walk us through the exit from the first company. I don't know which one it was, but walk us through that, and then like the mindset, and then how you did it, and how you felt after you did it. Uh, you mean the transition into my own? Um, business, yeah. I was at a, a CPaaS company, so telecommunications tech um, at the time, and just, ugh, I was miserable. I was miserable. Uh, it, it, it got to a point where I was, you know, throwing up before work. I was just uh, every day. Um, I mean, it was a toxic work environment, but that's for a different, a different podcast. <laughs> but yeah. Um, my husband and I always like to talk about the fact that he's like a marathon runner, slow and steady. He can go 26 miles. I'm a sprinter. I just do things sometimes without thinking. And I was so at my wits end that I just quit and didn't have a plan. Um, knew I was going to, you know, get back into the workforce at some point, but, but had an idea for a company and then just quit. Didn't have a business plan didn't have contacts. So I don't recommend that anyone who's listening, <laughs> like leverage your W2 as long as you can, mm -hmm. you know, raise money, put your business plan together. If you're going to bootstrap, get those, get those funds ready. Um, but I was so miserable and I am such a spontaneous person that that's what I did. And so for the next, I want to say two weeks, I was glued to my computer, learning, learning packaging, learning um, the CPAS industry, or I'm sorry, the, the CPG industry, learning um, shipping costs, how to do it yourself, drop shipping, um, you know, federal compliance and 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 how the FDA approves food and what what stickers I would need on these on these bars if I wanted to have an advisor who was a doctor a nutritionist, all these things. And I met with probably like 200 people. Um, I had maybe like five, five, 15 different, different components of what the artwork would look like on these bars. I had my entire business plan and I was working the same amount, if not more, but I loved it. I loved it. I was so passionate about it. Not necessarily that I wanted to get into the food and beverage industry, but I just felt like I was making something that was mine that, sorry about that, that I could call my own. And it didn't feel like work at that point. Yeah. So that's what I did. I launched, I launched the company. I want to say like a record breaking one month after I left my job. One month. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And you you're much, you're in a much different spot. I mean, I can get your situation if you're in a toxic work environment, you know, I, I don't recommend burning the ships either, but no. hey, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Your mental health <laughs> is more important. And you've already, exactly. you know, you mentioned you had the stroke. So it's like, maybe, maybe you exactly. did the, I think you did the right thing probably. Um, all right. So how did, how did the business go? I mean, you, it sounds like you really went at it. You know, you talked to, met, met with 200 people. I mean, I know, existing successful business owners that don't do that. So keep, <laughs> well, keep going the, with the story. How did the yeah, business go? That's the benefit of being in sales is I just, I thrive off of 
interpersonal communication and learning from people. And I think that is something that a lot of founders um, stop doing is realizing that the foundation of starting a business is learning. And if you, if you're not learning, you're not, your business isn't going to survive. Yeah. So you, you always need to be curious. And so that's, that's how I started. And I can be absolutely stubborn sometimes. Like I was very stubborn on the name. I wanted it to be named after my mom, but I had a couple of investors come in and say, no, you need to change it because it doesn't make sense. I was like, that oh, was screw you. It was my company. So like, I <laughs> definitely felt some of that stubbornness. Um, but in terms of the product, so I did a ton of research, my poor siblings, I would sit them down like seven times a day and be like, all right, try this prototype. We'd be on family vacation skiing. And I'd be like, oh, wait, try this flavor, try this flavor yeah. for like months, um, or weeks and then months. But, um, but we we come up came up with an MVP and it tasted really good. And I started, you know, giving it to my friends. I did a bunch of taste tests at different pop-ups in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I lived in San Francisco at the time. Another reason why we'll get to the demise, <laughs> but right. it was just very expensive. Thankfully, there's a lot of money in San Francisco. A lot of people that start companies, just not a lot of CPG companies. But anyway, back to the story. Um, we started, we launched the website. When I say we, I mean, I mean myself and I. Um, <laughs> Launched the website. I was making all of the bars. I had a commercial kitchen, like an hour and a half south yeah. um, that I drove to every morning. And I was there for about eight to 10 hours a day making these bars with, you know, a hairnet and gloves and restrictions and rules and all this stuff. And then I'd come home and I would do the marketing and I take Instagram pictures and make videos and you know, fulfill orders and then take them all to the, the U S postal service. <laughs> it oh. was so scrappy, but it was so awesome. And I remember there was this one day that I went to a, um, like an official packaging company. It was in mm -hmm. Concord and, you know, I obviously wasn't making any money. We were, we were, we were on track. We were making about a couple of thousand a month. So we were on track to doing, you know, 12 to 20,000 a year in mm -hmm. revenue, not a lot of money. It's obviously way less money than I make now or made at the time. But I remember walking to my car and I, the wind like blowing in my hair I was like, Oh my God, Beyonce. I felt like such a badass. I felt like such a badass. It was a tiny startup, small business, snack bar company, you know, yeah. but I felt like I had just won the lottery because I did it. I did it myself and nothing can take that feeling away from you. And so I'm happy it worked out this way. I'm happy I failed. Um, because if I didn't, I would still think, you know, I'm some, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one can yeah. touch me and everyone can touch you. <laughs> I mean, consensually, you know what I mean? For those of you that are not watching on YouTube, I am smiling ear to ear because it's so <laughs> it's awesome to hear someone who's, you know, making a pile of dough. Yes. Feeling like a badass at making a couple thousand dollars a month. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's so and the amount of my friends who, because in San Francisco, all of your friends are making six figures, multiple six figures, yep. um, if not more. Yep. Um, and everyone is driving the nicest car you know we were in our 20s at the time you know everyone was on on track to purchasing their first home at 28 you know it, it's just yeah. that's just what you do and the amount of times I had people say what the hell are you doing are you serious like this is this is why people move to San Francisco and you're starting a snack company that's for that's for the Midwest like you know go live in go live in Texas and rent a commercial kitchen there what are you thinking renting renting it in San Francisco yeah um so the amount of doubt that I got was it just like palpable that it, it, it never it was never ending I want to say yeah, yeah yeah that's when you know you're doing the right thing yes. when everyone's telling you to, to to not do it are you crazy so absolutely yeah. that's like how I live my life kind of against the grain <laughs> you should 
Why, why did you, why do you think the bit, I mean, you say failed, but I mean, again, I, and there's, yeah. there's a lot of definitions about what that is. I mean, the fact that you tried is, is a, is a huge win, but what, yeah. what, what happened? Why do you think it, it, it's no longer there and you went back? Yeah. Thank you for calling that out. Fail. I don't believe in failing. It's, I only believe in learning. And so yeah. that's what I did. Um, so I didn't, mm, let's just call it fail for now. We all know that I mean something different, but yeah. The reason, the reason it didn't flourish and we're not the next Luna bar or cliff bar, um, the pandemic started and my commercial kitchen shut down Mm. and you need a special license to be making these bars at home. And even then you can only make a certain amount and it needs to obviously, someone needs to come in and inspect and all that good stuff. It wasn't happening during the pandemic, we also moved from San Francisco up to Napa Valley. So it was a lot of turmoil. Um, and we saw, we saw a dip in orders. Um, and I just decided I, it was getting too, uh, stressful, not in the fact that it was too much work and the fact that I had associated so much value to how much money I make Hmm. at, a year off of a multi six figure salary. Yep. I was starting to feel it. And my husband and I were starting to talk about buying a house and it just, it, it didn't make sense to continue doing that as my full-time job. And so my initial plan was to go back to deck and, and, you know, give it my all, but also have this as my side hustle and as my, you know, primary, my business. Mm-hmm. Um, but after a while, tech took over and it became became the soul, <laughs> the sole purpose again. Okay. How much time has passed since the business and now? Uh two years. Okay. Got it. Got it. So um are you somewhat back to where you were before you left? Um, I wouldn't or- say I wouldn't say bad. I, I, I was at a dark time. <laughs> yeah. It was a very dark time when I left um, the, the tech workforce initially, but I would say that burnout is definitely, is definitely here. The burnout yeah. is definitely, I don't think that ever went away. Um, yeah. You know, when, when my husband and I take a vacation, we both say it takes like three days, even for us to unwind. Cause there's just so much pent up stress and you've got 70 different to-do lists in your head and it just it takes you time for your body to just chill and and really relax and that's why we drink so much tequila you know (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i can confirm that ladies (laughs) (laughs) the wednesday (laughs) um but uh it's the same when you're leaving the tech workforce it it took me months of anxiety to, to be like, you're chill out. Like you don't have a quota right now. I know you feel like you need to be making the six figures in order to, to feel valuable, but you can find other ways. Um, and so it's almost really difficult for me to even find that fulfillment or happiness somewhere else, because if it's not tied to money, I don't know how to quantify it. Wow. That's such a great share. And I don't think m- most people would, ad- would admit that. And I was the same way for so long. And even still up until like recently, that's how like it becomes your identity, right? Like, yeah. your, like your paycheck or your income. Absolutely. Again, and harping on this point, especially as a female in tech, it's just like, hell yes, I made it. I made it here. This room is filled with males double my age. Yeah. And I get paid the same amount. So you, you've like latch onto it. And again, mm-hmm it becomes your identity and, and it's almost like a point of pride. But then at that point, you're making decisions based on your ego. And if anyone's ever read the Bible, it's probably not the best way to make decisions. Probably not. But by the way, what you said about, you know, being, being the woman who is, you know, matched up with the men, I mean, that's something to celebrate, right? Whether you're in a, whether you don't like your job or not, that's something to celebrate. Okay. Exactly. I wrote down, something you said earlier and I I write down a bunch of quotes, but it's a quote now. So (laughs) scrappy, but so awesome. Like that's about your, and then the, you know, the hair flowing Beyonce moment, like 
but that's great. But that's how you felt. And, and do you still think about like, what's your, I know you got something, you know, in your head. Do you still think about doing that, that moment and doing it again? I would say 24, 24 hours a day. Yeah. I think about it. Um, driving down the highway, if I see a billboard, it, 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 not only do I think about getting into that industry, but I think about, oh, but what about the billboard industry? Uh, that, like, let's look at advertising dollars. I, I just, every single thing I see, commercials, um, advertising, emails, I, I think about potential businesses. Like, I know I'm an entrepreneur. And what's hard is, and this is going to sound pompous, but I don't know if there's other people that feel this way. In my household growing up, you were not allowed to be bad at something. Mm. Um, it's taken me a lot of therapy, <laughs> but I, I both loved it and hated it. I loved it in the fact that, again, harping on the point that I'm in this room with so many engineers and, and salespeople and, and I'm keeping up that is a skill that I, I learned. I just, I learned to adapt and to figure out ways to become good at things. The downside is I don't know what I like. I don't know. I, I if, if you're good at a lot of things, you, you figure out ways to like those things. And I don't know what I like. I mean, I think I'm getting closer, but yeah. It's hard. It's hard to take a step back and have a completely blank slate and figure out a way to make money from something that maybe is your hobby. Maybe you don't want to make money from something that's your hobby. Maybe you're better at this thing. How do I apply my sales skills? You know, it's, it's, it's hard, but yeah. end of the day, if you're passionate, you will find a way to make a, as much money as you want. Totally. Okay. This is, a, so I can assure you that people feel the same way as you do. I mean, okay. in my, in my real estate group, um, I have tons of high income earners that speak similarly to you. Yeah. Okay. Now none of them had a stroke and I don't mean to make light of the situation, <laughs> but I'm just, you know, that, that's how we, that's how we are. But, um, <laughs> they hate their, they hate their lives, right? They don't, they're just so unhappy, but they just, and they say the same thing as you is I don't really know what I'm passionate about. And yeah. the, I think the lesson here is that, and, and you and I talked about this, uh, when we were in Mexico, uh, sharing said tequila, but you know, if you can, you, would it be safe to say that if you're, high six figure income, multiple six figure income was covered, you'd still be doing that one to $2,000 a month gig. Yes. Right. So I think that's the block for a lot of people is it's like, how do you do that? And it's really about learn having other income streams come in and, and yes. just the mindset of the W2 employee. I was like that for years was like, Oh, I got to replace this with one thing. Yep. And I think that's why a lot of the, uh, the, the, yep. the side hustles don't make it. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't think if I had stayed with Simply As and continued doing my CPG company, mm -hmm. I, who knows where I'd be right now? Probably still not anywhere near the amount of money I'm making. And so it's an endurance race. And as I said earlier, like I'm not an endurance racer. I'm a sprinter. And um, I'm, I'm trying to, again, learn from my husband, who is like the cool, calm, collected MBA student has his master's, you know, really freaking smart and loves tech and trying to learn as much as I can from him. Um, and he's, he's been an amazing mentor and, and kind of getting me on that track and telling me like, dude, you don't have to be a hundred percent all the time. You can like take a day over your, sometimes your 30% and that's still okay. A step forward is a step forward. It doesn't have to be a leap. Yeah. Going yeah. steady. You guys are great together for sure and learning from each other. So, and I'm sure he's super inspired by you as well. Cause it's, it's hard, <laughs> yeah. it's hard not to notice that. I'm like, wow, I'm not, I'm not doing enough here. Ali's, you know, running, <laughs> running, running to the moon here. But so what do you think is, um, again, I, you know, I, we, we, I know you got a lot, bunch of ideas floating in your head, but what would you do different if you were to do it again? Um, I probably wouldn't do, I probably wouldn't do anything with food. Um, 
it just gave me too much anxiety, shelf life of food. It, it's, it's just too much of a risk. Mm -hmm. I'm, even though I'm, you know, crazy, go out and do it. Let's be spontaneous and start a business in an hour. Yeah. Um, I probably I'm still very risk averse. And so I want to be less risky. Um, well, not risk. I, I, you know, I wouldn't say it exactly like that, but less, uh, I don't want there to be a shelf life for my, my company. My husband and I bought a property next door to our house. And I think we told you this, that we're, we're starting to build. Now, yep. first we were going to build a house that we were going to live in, but um, there was a, a, an ordinance in California that passed um, that would allow us to build more. And so that was kind of our first step into real estate. And ever since we started talking about that, I started trying to wrap my head around either property management or real estate or Airbnbs or buying rentals. And recently we started coming up with a business plan for, um, for rental units in, oh. in California. The thing is California is freaking expensive as everybody knows. <laughs> and so we're trying to find not, not different loopholes, but at least different ways that I could start to, to manage that. I've always been so passionate about real estate. I love houses. I love architecture. I love design. I love being creative and I love talking to people. And it just seems like such a perfect amalgamation of all those things that I have never gotten before. Yeah. So we're starting. I, I want I want to put a big asterisk on this episode and say like the story's not finished. <laughs> but it's we're not. <laughs> and you just uh declared to the entire audience what you are passionate about. You said you didn't know and then you just said it. I love I it. Know. I know. I love it. So uh, I know we're making progress. I told you I move fast. <laughs> right. There there it is. And obviously I'm uh, very pro real estate because I have a real estate business and I think yeah. it's a great, a great way to, you know, uh, and I have other things that I'm passionate about too that don't as much money and I get to do yeah. those because of real yeah. estate or because of different stuff. So, um, yeah, I love it. Listen, Allie, you know, a lot of people are going to resonate with your story, you know, whether it's other females, uh, or, or men. And again, your vulnerability is very, uh, um, appreciative. I'm appreciative of it. And I think a lot of people are going to be appreciative of it. So you're telling it like it is right. And at least you had, you had the, courage to do what most people are thinking, but they just, they're just too scared. Like I can't leave this situation because how am I going to pay for my whatever? Yeah. How am I going to eat? You know? No. So we were talking a little bit offline. Yeah. You know, I think there's going to be people that they're going to want to reach out to you. So what's the oh. best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, honestly, email is probably the best. Um, feel free to email me. You know, if we can, if you want to continue having a conversation, we can we can chat over the phone, but I think email would probably be amazing. I'd love to hear from anybody who's who even just got inspired for a second <laughs> and maybe and wants to go run a marathon now. <laughs> awesome. So spit out the email and then we'll leave it in the show notes. Alexandra M. Gabrielli at gmail.com. It is okay. long. Look at the show notes. I'm sorry. It's like one tweet, an entire tweet and an email address. <laughs> it's an entire tweet and email address. All right. That's great. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, again, take advantage of it because if you listen to this episode, I mean, there's a ton of value here. There's a ton of nuggets that she's dropping and, and just being, you know, vulnerable and you can learn a lot from her. Um, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave? Something I didn't ask you or maybe that you wanted to share before we go? I would say uh, the biggest thing that helped me understand um, all of why I do things and what my fears were and why it was really scary to leave my W-2 job, start a business, now I'm back starting it again, um, was understanding the foundation of those fears. Um, a lot of that was done in therapy or with a career coach, I would say that is my biggest piece of advice is understand why you react to certain situations or act out of fear in certain situations, because until you acknowledge and understand why you do things, you can't change them and you can't tackle that fear. So I would say 100%, if you don't talk to a career coach or a mentor or a therapist already start, because it's, it's going to give you the kind of the gumption and the, the power um, and taking it back so you can make those decisions and kind of change your life. 
but it's scary. I understand, but it's that first step. The first step is always the hardest. A hundred percent. That's a, that's a, that's a great final thoughts on mic drop moment. And you said the word gumption. So, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't hear that one every day. Um, no, in all seriousness, Allie, you're awesome. So glad that we met you. And I believe you coined the phrase vacation besties. Um, vacation besties. That's right. how you're on my phone. <laughs> yeah, this is just seriously awesome. I learned a bunch from you and, and thanks so much for, for, for agreeing to be on and, and sharing and sharing your story with us today. Really appreciate it. Everyone so make it a great day.